Hello, I'm Leonard Malton, and I'm very happy to be here today with Marty Sklar, who is the vice chairman and principal creative executive of Walt Disney Imagineering, and a man who's spent a lot of time not only with Walt Disney, but thinking about the same things Walt thought about. When did you start to work for Walt Disney? About a month before Disneyland opened uh, in June of 1955. The Disneyland Park and the Disneyland TV show came into people's consciousness about the same time. And they both featured one significant element, and that was Tomorrowland. And that's what we want to talk to you about. Was Walt as futurist and visionary in a literal as well as figurative sense? Can you give us an idea of what the thinking was at that time about Tomorrowland and what it represented and what then was expressed on the TV shows? Well, I think uh, one thing you had to know about Walt Disney was he uh, would frequently go around to the great laboratories of American industry at that time. And of course, for Walt Disney, they always trotted out the most amazing things that we're working on. And uh, that, I think, spurred Walt's interest in the Tomorrowlands and, and future things. Would you think of him as a futurist? Oh, absolutely. And he was always going beyond what he had done the last time and uh, using technology to tell his stories. That's a good one. That's a good one. How would you like to have one of these little dinosaurs for a pet? Actually, they're tame as a kitten, quite friendly. And they won't bite the hand that feeds them. You know, we used to say about Imagineering, uh, it was, this was the, the way Walt loved to describe it, that uh, it's a blending of creative imagination with technical know-how. And the technical know-how, was, he was always reaching for something new, a new way to tell stories. In the most famous, arguably most famous World's Fair of the 20th century, the 1939 New York World's Fair, the theme was the world of tomorrow. And most World's Fairs look to the future in some way, but that was a particularly significant one. How would you differentiate what Walt did at Disneyland from what people saw in that 1939 fair? Well, two things come to mind uh, immediately. One uh, was, in retrospect, the Second World War came along, and all of a sudden, so many of the things that were predicted at that fair were put on hold. Mm -hmm. So for many years, it appeared that that fair had set out things that were almost in the far future rather than the near future. The other thing that I would distinguish is that Walt really wanted people to participate. And so all the Tomorrowlands aimed autopia cars, riding a monorail, uh, all of those things that uh, he really wanted people to be able to experience. You know, it's the old story about seeing an apple and taking a bite of the apple, and he always wanted people to be able to take that bite. America in the 50s. Uh, was healing from World War II and the Korean War, and it was the era of the baby boom, the, uh, a time of prosperity, and it, from this sprang Disneyland and uh, a lot of Disneyland TV shows. The space program was the next step beyond that, but I wonder about Tomorrowland itself. When you opened the park, everything in it was just so incredible, so unlike anything anyone had seen at Coney Island or, you know, Pacific Ocean Park or any of the older playgrounds or amusement parks. Actually, Tomorrowland and Disneyland, the first year, was not very good. Uh, it had things like the bathroom of the future, <laughs> <laughs> if you could picture that. I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> yes. And it had a satellite view of America where you got on a platform and went from day to night uh, and saw uh, what, uh, what the country looked like from a satellite view, which, of course, there hadn't, wasn't, was no satellite at that time, so it was all depicted by uh, uh, the Disney artist. Walt wanted all of that out, you know, quickly. Disneyland opened in 1955. By 1959, he'd replaced half of what was in Tomorrowland. We were working on a whole new Tomorrowland when Walt passed away, and it opened just after he died. And that was when the people mover came in. And, and then he brought the carousel uh, progress from the New York World's Fair. And the carousel, it turned out to be an excellent 
way of, of depicting the future because we didn't have to change the 1890s to that. We didn't have to change the 1920s and the 1940s. All we had to do was deal with the, the last act. And so uh, we always kept changing the current and a little step into the future. Walt, particularly in that Carousel of Progress, expressed what was said in that Sherman Brothers song. It's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. He's the only futurist I know who had a smile on his face about the future. Well, first of all, Walt Disney was the real, the eternal optimist, and he really believed that things could be better. And Bob and Dick Sherman wrote that song as a personal ode to Walt. And really, they really meant it, a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. Well, they really, that was Walt's anthem, and they recognized that. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, just a dream away. Well, a beautiful tomorrow, just a dream away. That says we're going places. There's progress ahead. One of the high points of the early TV shows was the series on space exploration. And one wouldn't have automatically associated Walt with space exploration and, and a serious examination of where America was heading. Did you ever get a sense of why he was so enamored of that? I think it was the, this whole idea of, of uh, showing predictions of, of the future. And uh, he brought in a lot of the people that were involved in the American space program. And they became um, his consultants, if you will, and his advisors as to the kinds of predictions he should make out of those TV shows. We do know that they were seen by President Eisenhower and that it was a stimulus to him for pushing the American space program. Walt had an amazing capability, it was always said, of not only discovering and nurturing talent, but channeling talent into unexpected areas. Uh, I'm going to ask you later on about your own experiences, but uh, one wouldn't have thought immediately of Ward Kimball as the man to supervise those shows, but you wound up working with Ward quite a bit in later years. What do you think it was about Ward that made him the right guy, which he turned out to be? Well, it probably was two things. The first, Walt might not have had a specific assignment for, <laughs> for Ward at that time. But the other thing is, Ward was, as Walt said, the, the, the real genius in the, in the organization. And I think he knew that Ward would get fascinated by the whole idea of being able to travel in space. You know, he was always stepping out and, and trying something different. And, you know, I think that's probably a lot of what Walt admired in him because that was Walt, too. Walt always said to us, I'm not interested in what you did yesterday because I'm not going to be there. I know I can do that. It's the next thing that I'm interested in. Do you remember your feelings as America did enter the space race and as we started chalking up those incredible milestones? What did it feel like for you having worked, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of an entertainment or informational way uh, on some of the same subject matter. Well, I think the most exciting uh, time was when we first landed on the moon. And I was out at, in Tomorrowland at Disneyland with uh, the flight to the moon, and there were thousands of people who wanted to be there at that location to see whether what we had predicted was actually the way it turned out. And they weren't disappointed. <laughs> well, that's the highest compliment I would think you could have, that your Futurism, if there is such a word, turned out to be a pretty good reality when that came to pass. Yeah, I remember John Hent saying, well, I wonder if people are going to be disappointed that um, they didn't jump quite as high as our people did. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also worked with Walt on the 64 New York World's Fair, which was a, uh, one of the high points of his later career. Tell us what kind of things he wanted to achieve there. Now, a lot of those were commissioned projects, but I'm sure the, the creative end of it came from the Disney people. 
I think he had two primary objectives. The first was to continue to build Disneyland. And so all the things that, that he developed for that 64-65 uh, New York World's Fair, in one way or another, came back from the fair to Disneyland. Uh, that was one objective. The other, it was a stepping stone to the Walt Disney World project because at that time it was very hard for Disney to get its pictures played in Ma on Manhattan Island. And there weren't a lot of theaters that played the Walt Disney type of picture. And so there was a, a real interest on his part in communicating to that, quote, sophisticated New York audience about the kind of entertainment that Disneyland had uh, been putting on for 10 years by that time. One of Walt's great dreams was building a city, a community of the future, and that's what Epcot originally was intended to be. Can you talk a little about that and his original plans or dreams for that? When he saw a problem, he would, oh, he would identify with it and try to find a way to solve it. And I think that's where the whole idea of Epcot came in. And what's amazing to me, and uh, I didn't even know all of this at the time, but Walt had so many different people working on aspects of a city of, of the future. He was really into it. I remember reading with great fascination about his ideas for this model city. Uh, and some of the things he thought about have been adopted, like putting, putting uh, power lines underground. Uh, but he had more advanced even ideas than that in terms of traffic flow and, uh, and, and controlling that so there wouldn't be congestion and there wouldn't be traffic jams that inevitably occur in any, in any city of any size. Uh, what do you think his model or utopian community would have been like? It's interesting that you uh, use that word because uh, when I was first asked to do some work on, on uh, the Epcot project, I came back to my boss, Dick Irvine, who ran design here at Imaginary, the next morning and I said, I think the name is wrong. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I think it should be called Waltopia. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I didn't win, but <laughs> I don't know if it ever got the Walt, but, but it really was. It was Walt's v vision of a utopian um, place to live. I believe we can build a community here that more people will talk about and come to look at than any other area in the world. I'm sure this experimental prototype community of tomorrow can influence the future of city living for generations to come. It's an exciting challenge. A once in a lifetime opportunity for everyone who participates. What was the purpose of that Epcot film? Walt really wanted to communicate what he was planning to do. There were two publics, if you will. The first was the legislature in the state of Florida, because without getting certain uh, uh, powers, if you will, directly for the Walt Disney Company, he couldn't achieve a lot of things that he uh, really wanted to do. That was one. And the second was to the public. He wanted to say uh, to the public certain things. And the th actually, the third was American industry, because he knew he couldn't do this by himself. He had to have the kind of the World's Fair setup. And actually, on the Epcot film, he had me write two endings. One was directed toward the state of Florida, public and legislature. And the other was directed to American industry. And uh, he was pushing me because, we, you know, that was the last time Walt was ever on film, was uh, the Epcot film, and those two endings were the last things we did. Oh, ever the salesman. And it was considered a success, and obviously it, it did achieve its goal, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. We used the film about four or five months after Walt died for the first time, and it went to the legislature, and it was used on public television, and in Florida and really raised the, the level of uh, understanding of what Walt Disney World uh, was going to be. Tell us a little about how Epcot was eventually designed and what were the priorities. Walt had passed on by now and uh, Epcot changed from being a model community to uh, uh, kind of an exhibition hall about the future. 
Well, uh, the first thing that happened after Walt died was there was even a question of whether the company was going to go ahead with the Walt Disney World project. And Roy uh, O. Disney made a fantastic commitment to making the, the Walt Disney World property um, and project a reality for his brother. As Walt said, this city of tomorrow will always be in a state of becoming, and it will never cease to be a blueprint of the future. And in fact, Roy had planned to retire and then uh, came out of retirement, basically, to uh, lead that effort. And he put so much into it that three months after we opened Walt Disney World in October of uh, 1971, he passed away. And uh, so we really had to establish the Walt Disney World uh, Resort as a place where people uh, went for their vacations. It wasn't until around 1975, almost 10 years after Walt died, that uh, we were asked to look at uh, the Epcot idea again. Then uh, Bard Walker... He was then the chairman of the Walt Disney Company, wasn't he? That's correct. He said, we have to figure out how we're going to proceed with Walt's idea for Epcot. So we started having a series of meetings where we brought together people from government, from industry, and from the private sector uh, and academia. And we had a conference on energy. We had a conference on transportation. We had a conference on food. One of my favorite experiences was when we opened the land pavilion at Epcot. And we had been working with a man by the name of Carl Hodges, who was the director of the Environmental Research Lab at the University of Arizona. And they helped us. They, they uh, designed the uh, food growing systems. And we were outside the pavilion. All of a sudden, he stopped dead in his tracks. And I said, Carl, what's the matter? And he said, I just realized that in the next three or four hours, more people will see my work than in the 30 years I've been doing this. Now, that's impact, I think, and communication of some wonderful work that only, a, only some people in the field had known. Now the public was getting all this. You took these things out of the lab and put them into public view and very prominent public view. Nobody listens to the government when they proclaim things in most of these areas. Nobody uh, trusts industry because they have an ax to grind. But everybody trusts Mickey Mouse. So everybody fed back to us that we had a role to play in communicating many of these subjects. Has Epcot changed as much as Tomorrowland has had to change to keep up with this constant chasing the future? It's changed in, in some degrees, uh, important, importantly. In other ways, it hasn't changed enough. Uh, we're doing a pavilion right now called Mission Space, which uh, will open uh, late this year. You know, that future is a moving target, and uh, it moves faster and faster, as a matter of fact. So we have a big challenge in keeping up with that. That's a wonderful circle that's come around, though, that from the beginnings of Walt and Disneyland's involvement with space and even prodding America toward interest in space exploration, you're now doing it again at Walt Disney World. And that's a good point, Leonard. Uh, it, it is full circle, and um, I think Walt would be very proud of this one. Can you summarize in any way, you've had so many years of experience in, in, in different arenas, even under the umbrella of things you've worked on for the Walt Disney Company. Can you summarize the kind of lessons you, you took away from Walt, particularly as regards his constant looking toward the future? Curiosity, a big one. Um, always wanting to learn more about whatever subject you were dealing with and really know it. Um, courage. You know, when, when, when you've decided that uh, th this is something you're going to do, do it right, absolutely right. Quality. Walt was so um, focused on quality and giving the public more than they would expect. And, and the optimism piece. I mean, 
he really believed in that. But I think, and storytelling, of course. I mean, uh, almost everything that we have done successfully is a great story to begin with. How it's interpreted in a three-dimensional environment is there's a lot of different options and some work better than others. But if it's got a good story at the heart of it, I mean, how are you ever going to top the Pirates of the Caribbean, for example? Uh, that's a quintessential idea and show. Um, and so I think those are the kinds of things that we all learned from Walt Disney. How did you come to be Walt's communicator? That, that's really what you were at one point, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. I just was uh, kind of in the right place at the, the right time and uh, had uh, the opportunity to write a few things for Walt that, that he really liked. And so he would, like everybody else, he would uh, send out a new challenge. And if you were up to it, uh, you went to the next rung on the ladder. Well, that means you must have been able to, in, in a sense, get inside his head. Uh, no one could have fully understood the genius that was, that was Walt. But you must have understood to a pretty great degree how he thought and, and how his thoughts came together. I've, I've expressed it this way. You know, I never had to think like my father as much as I loved him. But I had to try to think like Walt Disney because I had to find words that he would be comfortable with saying. And, for example, one of my favorites was the word things. Now you say, well, that's such a nothing word. But Walt would say, now the pirates are going to sack and burn the town, and then we're going to do some really exciting things. And when he said that word, he just let it hang. You see, our whole 40-some-odd years here has been in the world of making things move, inanimate things move, from a drawing to all kinds of any little props and things. You know, the first time I heard him do that, I said, I'm going to write that word in almost everything I, I do with him because it painted pictures beyond what you could imagine. And if, when I could find little things like that and bring them out and know that when he said them, that it would have a whole new meaning, that was a, a, a great challenge and a great satisfaction. How would you describe what you do, Marty? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, I think the wonderful thing about my job is that there's so much talent here and everyone has new ideas and want obviously to sell their ideas to the management of the company. So uh, what's difficult for me uh, to think about doing something else or, or retiring is the fact that I come into work every day and there's new drawings, there's new ideas, there's people with passion about what they do. And I think, um, if anything, what someone in my position does is, is enable those ideas to come forward and to have a chance at becoming reality. What else gives you satisfaction at this stage of your career? Well, at Imagineering, uh, first of all, it's the reputation of Imagineering. Uh, uh, and we wonderful thing is receiving letters constantly from young people who want to become Imagineers. That says a lot. You know, Walt started bringing some of the great talents from the studio to Imagineering. He would bring Mark Davis and, and uh, Claude Coates, a great background artist from animation, and John Hinch and uh, Lane Gibson and a sculpting talent. He didn't know he was a sculptor, but Walt told him he was a sculptor. <laughs> And all of these people trained us all in goals they set and the quality of the product that they developed and their storytelling talent and the attention to detail. And all of that has gone into this great mix that Imagineers now draw on. And I actually think there's more talent here today than there's ever been, which is a great tribute to Walt and uh, those who went before us and uh, a great challenge for anybody new that comes in here. Just to sum this up, Marty, you were recently profiled in the Los Angeles Times where they described you as kind of a living link to Walt Disney for so many people who work here in the company, that they look to you because they know you, you were part of his inner circle. How does that make you feel? Old. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, but you have, you have the magic, see. You, you, you did get something from working here. You have a youthfulness of spirit. Well, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. You know, I'm, uh, next month, Leonard, I'll be 69. And, uh, you know, you think about uh, what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And I have people come to me almost every day and say, Marty, you can't leave. We need you here. You're, you know, you keep the thread. And uh, so that, that's hard because, you know, do you live outside your own body or do you say, <laughs> you know, this is, there's other things that I want to do. And uh, as I said earlier, the good news is that when you come in every day and there's so much energy and passion for what we do here, that makes it a little easier to stay around and, and grant the wishes that so many people express to me.